from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. If trees could talk. They needed long, straight timber for the kills of the landing craft. The important role this forested area played in helping to turn the tide of World War II. Another day, another record. How much higher could gas prices go? And the pork industry takes preventative measures. We think that prevention is the, is the best practice. How it's working to keep diseases out of the herd as Pork Week continues right now on Ag Day. Pork Week, paying tribute to the pork producers who bring lean and nutrient-rich pork to your table. Coverage brought to you by Merck Animal Health and the National Pork Board. Good morning and welcome to Ag Day. I'm Michelle Royal. Clinton is on assignment. Gas prices hitting another record high, knocking on the door of $5 a gallon on a national average. And diesel is setting another record high as well. AAA reporting the new highest average price of $4.95 a gallon. Wednesday marked the 12th straight day and the 29th time in the last 30 that gas prices have hit a record in the country. And in 16 states plus Washington, D.C., gas is already averaging over $5 a gallon. Diesel now topping $5.71 a gallon. And there is still no end in sight. Due to the summer travel season just getting underway, rising demand for gas, along with oil prices higher around the globe due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. One market watcher says gas could top $6 a gallon later this summer. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen grilled about gas prices before the House Ways and Means Committee yesterday. I guess the bottom line question is, is this increase in fuel prices intentional on the Biden administration it is, because it seems to me that it is irrefutable. It, it is an enormous burden on American households. And of I agree. Course, I agree. It, it seems like it's an intentional effort on the, the Biden administration. The president is authorized uh, a million barrel a day released from the strategic Petroleum Which is a drop in the bucket. It's a, it, it's a showpiece, and you know it. You know it's a showpiece. There are 9,000 permits that have been they want, they want the American Mr. people Rice, and more for gas to ease the great transition. Mr. Rice, could we let the secretary answer, please? Sure. There are 9,000 permits that have been issued that the oil and gas sector can take advantage of and 20 million acres of public lands under lease right now that are not being produced on. Yellen says Russia's war in Ukraine has impacted energy and food prices on a global scale and that virtually every developed country is also experiencing inflation. She also said the U.S. needs to become more dependent on solar and wind energy instead of oil, which is vulnerable to global markets. Meanwhile, the biofuels industry says record gas prices are fueling huge interest in blending more and higher blends of ethanol. Renewable Fuels Association President and CEO Jeff Cooper says, quote, we're seeing unprecedented interest in the wholesale market and blending sector. In E15, we're seeing E85 sales really taking off in certain parts of the country as well. He says on average, ethanol is selling for $1.30 less than gas. And EPA seems to be starting to recognize ethanol is part of the answer to high gas prices with its release of the final renewable volume obligations under the renewable fuel standard. However, the reaction of the ethanol industry to the numbers has been mixed. The agency announced the final numbers for the mandated renewable fuels blending levels for 2020 through 2022. Brian Jennings from the American Coalition for Ethanol tells me they're disappointed with the 2020 renewable volume obligations because they came in below actual production. However, he says the revised 2021 numbers were more favorable with a slight increase and that momentum built into 2022 numbers. For 2022, we are very gratified that not only did EPA maintain the 15 billion gallon blending obligation for that calendar year, but in addition to that, Michelle, they're adding 250 million gallons in terms of an additional blending obligation for refiners. He says the additional volume brings EPA into compliance with the lawsuit the ethanol industry won back in 2016 regarding the blend wall. EPA also denied the balance of the pending small refinery exemptions from the Trump administration, and Jennings says that is a huge step going forward because of the precedent it sets. 
A powerful storm brought damaging hail to southern Nebraska and northern Kansas midweek. Aaron Jajak catching this video of the storm west of Sydney, Nebraska, as it moved in. The storm looking even darker as it came over Jay Reiner's farm in Juanita, Nebraska. Jay tells us the storm took out windows at his house and says his corn is toast, but he is hoping the beans will survive. Golf ball-sized hail was reported in the area, along with winds in the 60 to 70 mile per hour range. And now the chance for severe weather is pushing into the middle of the country. Matt Yurisovic is tracking it now. Yeah, Michelle, and we've got some of those, a uh, couple of rounds of storms here over the next few days, but starting out in the center of the country for today, and you can see that severe weather threat right here outlined in yellow all the way from extreme southern South Dakota, going through parts of uh, Nebraska and eastern Colorado through Kansas, and eventually ending up in northern Texas. Oklahoma and then down into the Gulf Coast as we head into the day on Friday. There will be the threat for a couple of stronger storms with some potential for hail, gusty winds, some heavy rain, and even an isolated tornado threat within there as well. So let's send you over to our future track model here heading through the day on Thursday. You can see that severe weather threat outlined right here and those storms developing east of the Rockies and then continuing to move east through Kansas, through Oklahoma, and as that low moves to the south and east, that severe weather threat will follow it overnight and then into the day on Friday. Now we've got those stronger storms through Mississippi and southern Alabama as that cluster of storms continues to follow that low and that cold front down through the south. And after the storm, a rainbow. Johnny Dansel of Wallace County, Kansas, sharing this spectacular shot he says they saw some hail, but dodged the damage to the irrigated wheat. That's a good thing for sure. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Our pork week coverage continues with the market outlook for hogs. Now, lean hog futures hit new contract highs on March 31st and then corrected nearly $25 before bouncing in mid-May. Market support has come from tight supplies as year-to-date slaughter is nearly 5% below 2021. However, it's being somewhat offset as pork exports are off last year's record pace with less China business. Plus, economic uncertainty is dampening domestic demand. So where are prices headed the rest of 2022? And will we retest contract highs? Yeah, we're into a lower supply here. We have been all year long, uh, down about 5% uh, relative to a year ago. Unfortunately, that hasn't provided for some, some elevated cutout values uh, uh, compared to a year ago. And so I think we're really experiencing some challenges as it relates to the demand side of the equation. I question the, the, uh, the chance of, of going back and testing those highs. You know, historically, this time of year is a good time to be, to be looking at some hedging opportunities. And I'm not so sure that, that this year isn't much different. So we're going to have some tight hog supplies over the next 30 days or so. Bunter says the lean hog futures did allow producers to lock in some profits, even with high feed prices, but those margins are below 2021. The U.S. pork industry's priorities this year have included trade, ag labor, and foreign animal disease prevention. As part of that, the National Pork Board made a strategic investment to prevent diseases like African swine fever, including the development of a new program called AgView. The free technology solution provides traceability for pork producers. With enough voluntary participants, AgView will help the industry rapidly contain an FAD outbreak. This will allow regionalized pork export bans so trade can normalize more quickly in the event of an outbreak. Pigs that we call AgView. So it's owned by the producer, the producer controls their data, but in the event of an emergency, like a foreign animal disease, they can share that data really quickly digitally with the state veterinarian. That's going to be really important so A, we can manage the disease, and B, they can actually get their businesses back up and running in time. The big question is can U.S. producers actually keep ASF out of the country? We think that prevention is the is the best practice. So we're really focused on prevention and work with Custom and Border Protection and also working with the USDA. USDA is providing technical support but has also stepped up with $500 million of Commodity Credit Corporation funds to combat foreign animal diseases, which is unprecedented. The pork industry is also working with USDA and the states on emergency response plans in the event of an outbreak. 
Cattle and soybeans were the darlings of the commodity sector on Wednesday. We'll have market analysis up next. And remembering D-Day 78 years later, how this Louisiana forest played an important role in the battle coming up. Ag Day TV is brought to you by the National Pork Board with checkoff funding. Real pork, real results. For more, visit porkcheckoff.org. Joining us with market analysis from World Pork Expo is Pat Von Church with Professional Ag Marketing. A nice up day in corn and beans on Wednesday. New contract highs in soybeans. And we've been seeing a lot of bull spreading in both markets. So kind of demand is pushing these two? Yeah, absolutely, Michelle. We continue to see uh, firmer basis levels on old crop corn and soybeans. And that's adding, adding to strength here on the old crop complexes. And at the same time, <clears throat> gosh, we're off to a really good start. And, and so I think that might be putting just a little bit of pressure on new crop today as, as we continue to uh, experience a pretty good start to the growing season. You know, condition scores came out uh, on Monday, and if the three big I states came in at 10% higher than their average ratings in the good excellent category. So off to a good start in the core part of the belt. Yeah, and you got to believe maybe a little positioning ahead of the report, the WASD coming out on Friday with expectations of lower ending stocks in both corn and beans. Yeah, exactly. I think we are tightening up that old crop balance sheet and then continued questions about what's going to happen in the, in the region of, uh, of uh, Ukraine and what impact that might have on our exports as we try to finish out this crop. Season. So we would expect to see some tightening of, a, of the balance sheet on old crop uh, on Friday. And Wednesday was a nice update in cattle one month highs and that was kind of pushed by higher cash, wasn't it? Yeah, we continue to hear some good numbers uh, being traded here a couple weeks out, three weeks out in some cases. And so um, we're, we're, uh, we're optimistic that we're going to be able to roll this, uh, this relatively firm uh, cash market forward and uh, it sure has the nearby cattle market paying attention. Okay, do you think we'll go much higher here? Do, will we retrace? I think we got a chance to uh, um, go back and, and look at some of those old highs and we'll see if, um, if we can't maintain the momentum in the cash market. That'll be the key here. I'm a little bit concerned about maintaining good protein demand as we go through the summer, Michelle. So if we're going to get some, uh, uh, some additional opportunities in the futures market, I think it's going to need to happen sooner versus later. All right. Thanks for joining us. Pat Bonchers, Professional Ag Marketing. More Ag Day coming up. As your innovative and invested partner, Merck Animal Health is dedicated to the well-being of the swine industry and the people behind it. Merck Animal Health driven by prevention. Joining us with Ag Weather, Matt Yersavik is back in and corn market is building in a little weather premium with ideas of a heat ridge building in maybe next week. We're already starting to see that build in what, the southwestern plains? Yeah, and we've been seeing that over the last couple of days. We've been in the triple digits there in the extreme southwest, but 80s, 90s, higher humidity. It's going to build right up through the center of the country through the end of this week and heading into next week as well. And you can see those temperatures in the triple digits this afternoon. Again, places like Yuma and Phoenix, Arizona, all the way up to Las Vegas and up to St. George as well. A lot of triple digit heat, very dry heat back here in the southwest though. And as this ridge builds through the center of the country, we're going to add some humidity to the mix, which means it's going to feel closer to the triple digits, but temperatures will likely be in the 80s and 90s. Here's a look at the temperatures as we head uh, really through the rest of the afternoon. What we're going to be looking at here this afternoon is 80s, 90s across the deep south through Texas, and then again, the triple digits back there in the west. Cooling off a little bit, but keeping it very, very warm across the south with a little bit of that humidity from central Texas on through the Gulf Coast, cooling off though in the northern plain states and upper Midwest. And then we're looking at again heat and humidity out there tomorrow afternoon. And that is going to build through the middle of the country as we head through the weekend and into next week. Notice that ridge building out west, moving into the center of the country. And this is where we're really going to start to see that 
heat and humidity ramp up by Monday and Tuesday of next week as a little bit of a ridge moves through the Pacific Northwest, but staying extremely warm and extremely humid in the east all through next week and into the following week as well. Again, that severe weather threat for today right there highlighted in yellow, and we are going to be seeing that chance for those storms moving right through the middle of the country with this low right here and then drifting towards the south. And as it does, that cold front's going to trigger those storms and then slide them into the day on Friday down across the Gulf Coast. And that's something that we'll have to keep an eye on. So precipitation here, more of it through the center of the country and off to the east. And that's something that we'll continue to keep an eye on. Meanwhile, staying dry in the southwest. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live. West End, New York, showers likely a high of 65 degrees. Heading to Stapleton, Nebraska, showers and thunderstorms likely a few could be severe. High of 82 and a high of 100 degrees. Sunny and hot in Kingman, Arizona. Find farm equipment on Machinery Pete's June 21st online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerypeat.com. Agribusiness Today is brought to you exclusively by CHS, your partner in the field providing precision agriculture solutions to farmers across the country. Cattle producers have voiced their concerns to the EPA regarding the ongoing Waters of the U.S. rulemaking process. They took part in a roundtable organized by the Kansas Livestock Association. The roundtable is one of 10 being conducted by the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers. Among those taking part, Sean Tiffany of Tiffany Cattle Company of Kansas and the president-elect of the Kansas Livestock Association. He owns a custom cattle operation in three Kansas counties spanning over 100 miles with a capacity of 30,000 head. I am not opposed to regulation. Uh, water quality not only impacts my own operation and those of my neighbors, but those of the people in the cities who are using our products, whether that's home builders, oil, uh, aggregate, or agriculture commodities. But where I think the EPA's jurisdiction stops and it probably is more effectively administered is in interstate water bodies, you know, rivers that cross state lines, large impoundments of water such as federal reservoirs. In addition to taking part in the round tables, NCBA has filed an amicus brief in a case that challenges EPA's authority under the Clean Water Act. It is called on EPA to pause any WOTUS rulemaking until that case is decided. This week, we're marking the 78th anniversary of D-Day, a turning point in World War II that has had its start in the Deep South. The details in the country. This week marks the 78th anniversary of D-Day, the massive invasion of Allied forces to stop Nazi Germany. The night before D-Day, members of the 101st Airborne Division parachuted into Normandy to help pave the way for the invasion. But did you know their journey really began in Louisiana? This week in Louisiana, Agriculture's Neil Melanson shows us where it all began. This is historic Camp Claiborne near Forest Hill, Louisiana, where once 50,000 soldiers lived with their civilian counterparts and support staff. It may be hard to believe, but right back over there was the bus station and gymnasium where it's now all overgrown. Douglas Rhodes is the executive director of the Southern Forest Heritage Museum, which preserves exhibits about the camp's role during the war. They completed all of their uh, physical fitness, basic inventory, all of those tactics were done here uh, at Camp Claiborne. The picture you see here is from a visit by Sergeant Dick York, the most decorated veteran of World War I, who came to the camp to address his former unit, the 82nd Infantry Division. It's hard to see it, but thousands upon thousands of soldiers were lined up right here, where now there's only wood. Louisiana agriculture also played another role in World War II. The straight longleaf pine trees were perfect for the keels of the Higgins boats, which brought the infantry that trained at Camp Claiborne ashore in Normandy. This is the old mill where those trees were processed. They needed long straight timbers for the keels of the landing craft. And so they put in an order with the Southern Forest Heritage Museum and they furnished the keels for uh, the boats that were being built 
uh, in New Orleans, the landing craft that were being built in New Orleans. As you can see, there's very little left of historic Camp Claiborne. In fact, this road that I'm walking on is one of the few things original to that time. However, the soldiers that walked this hollowed ground went on to liberate Europe, forever preserving their sacrifice, as well as this corner of Louisiana in history. Reporting from Camp Claiborne in Kasachi National Forest, I'm Neil Malasson. And our thanks to Neil and This Week in Louisiana for that story. Thanks for joining us this morning for Ag Day. For all of us here, have yourself a great day. It's time to sign up for the 2022 United Pork Americas Conference in Orlando, Florida. Register today at unitedporkamericas.com and join us September 7th through the 9th.